Welcome to the Bicurian Podcast, where we explore and embrace the seeming contradictions of life. What actually is Bicurian, you ask? Well, you may not necessarily have a mental concept of Bicurian, personally, maybe because it's a made-up word. You embody it. What's happening right now in terms of the divisions between us is a focus on that which is different. And lack of understanding and empathy for people's beliefs is no longer an excuse. And it is in the differences we carry in ourselves that we find the Bicurian moment. When you really dig into something, you're going to see some depth to it. It's not just a race thing. It's not just a conservation thing. It's letting go of the or to make room for the and. We embrace all of you. Welcome to the Vicarium. Welcome to the Vicarium Podcast. This is Eric. And I am Aisla. So, one of our formats we've been having fun with is you found an interesting article with some interesting topics. You're going to bring them up and I am going to, on the fly, develop some sort of a response. I certainly love it. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> I find it entertaining. Um, the good news is you don't mind when I ask you for clarification on things I don't understand. That's true. I, I am. And you just have such interesting thoughts and questions. Oh, good. So <laughs> so this this week's topic is on an article I found, and let me get the right reference, the Washington Post. And the title of the article is, The Chances Are You're Not As Open-Minded As You Think. Oh, definitely. Well, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, I read through it. I actually did, I remember, share some portion of it with you uh, a couple weeks ago. And, that's, and then I was thinking, you know, should we mention it on the fly? And, and, and you said, well, I think we should really do a show on it. I don't know if you remember that. But did you absolutely dug your own grave on this one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I immediately jumped on that. Absolutely. I, I was so absolutely. I expect nothing less. <laughs> oh, good. And uh, and so I I thought, but what I liked about it was they they had some different things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read some some of the context, and then we can kind of go from there. Um, but the first part was, you know, they they looked at a study from 2017, and they asked 2,400 people, so not a small 15 person study. Agreed. Like sometimes look at to consider arguments on politically controversial issues. And the issues they um, list here are same-sex marriage, gun control, and marijuana legalization. Yeah, they should have tried some, like, hardballs there. Like, like some really difficult ones to get like responses ageism? to. Yeah. <laughs> they, I don't know why they didn't have ageism in there. No. <laughs> um, and the the key to this was the they asked them to consider arguments on these controversial issues, politically controversial issues, that ran counter to the beliefs of the person they were talking to. Okay. And what they found was that both liberals and conservatives were simil similarly adamant about avoiding contrary opinions. And when it, so one example they give is that when it came to same-sex marriage, two-thirds of this, those that they surveyed passed on a chance to get money if, in exchange, they took some time to just look at counter-arguments. So what you're saying is two-thirds of the people were not even willing to be paid to take their head out of the sand. Right. Like when you say, you couldn't pay me to do that, literally. <laughs> they could not be paid. To even just re so what was the requirement just to read to look at it yeah so it's I'm I think if it's looking I would imagine that it was either reading or watching well, a video yeah or somebody something speaking like that. sure they weren't being asked to to seriously entertain it or anything like that just hear it yeah just will will you take a moment we're gonna give you some money I don't it doesn't say how much maybe it's five bucks but it's five bucks you didn't have before that's coffee yeah <laughs> you know and and. And and say, you know, just just take a minute or five minute, whatever, to read or listen to this, watch this movie, whatever. They said no. They wouldn't do it. That's really difficult for me. Um, I was going to say something really judgmental, like, that's just dumb. <laughs> but realistically, like, I don't think I'm that surprised. Many people do not actually want to be challenged on what they think, what they believe, and all of that. Even if, and this has always been my argument. 
to truly understand what my argument is, I have to see both sides before I can even formulate an opinion on like, well, I agree with this and I disagree with that. So what I'm hearing here is that they're judging the entire situation based on knowing that whatever the argument is, they probably just don't care. Well, or, or they, they don't, they, so the, one of the things, so the next part that they talk about, and and this is one of the, the arguments for open-mindedness. So it, so why do we care if anyone's open-minded aside from things might be a little more pleasant? Is, is there any functionality to it? And, and they said that, um, and they, they get into it later. So I'll just, I'll start with this assertion, which is that open-mindedness is one of the things that is a hallmark of an ability to make more accurate predictions about the future or about things that are trending or whatever. So I agree with that. Um, and it's, it's scientifically proven, as, proven, right? Okay. Asserted. And okay. So that's one of the assertions they make is, you know, we care about open-mindedness, not, not just because it means that they might be fewer flame wars. <laughs> well, to me, I mean, so to take it out of the political arena, like being able to decide the pros and cons of things is key. Like we do it in our life every day. A pro to sleeping in might be that you're tired and you'll feel more rested if you hit the snooze button a few times. The con might be you'll be late to work. So, so I mean, that, that's our daily routine is to evaluate both sides of a situation. Right. And it, and it, um, and the other thing they talk about is they said, so that the thing that makes this makes you more likely to be open-minded. One of the traits that, that you will, uh, have is you will imagine your own views as hypotheses in need of testing. So you are constantly gathering data against whatever your, you know, core conclusions or, or hypotheses are. I know what you're doing here. test them. What am I doing? That's the definition of critical thought. <laughs> like, oh, don't try to jump ahead. And so, but that's a, and so that's one of the things that they talked about in that, in the, that open-mindedness requires an ability to let go of the idea that your assertion is, you know, unequivocally right. Right. And something we talked about on the Trumpian left, the single issue haters con- uh, conversation that we had a couple weeks ago is that. Uh, liberals and conservatives tend to, at least politically, tend to look at the other side and notice the ways in which they are unwilling to acknowledge that the assertions they're making could have other views, but not willing to look at their own, uh, you know, political, dem- I'm going to say wrong, demagoguery. <laughs> I've read it a million times, but do I know how to pronounce it? No. <laughs> so, um, so there's that. And I thought that was a really interesting thing. And the the next step is that um, the open minded people, instead of trying to bring people around to their perspective, they encourage others to help them disprove what they already believe. And that sounds like the definition of an echo chamber. <laughs> but no, they so that's like the open mindedness is saying, help help me look at this and help me to try and disprove my, my. And it depends. I, I say echo chamber because immediately what, what jumped into my head was that most people will ask people who support them to agree with them. Yes. But you're saying that a, a measurement of open-mindedness might be asking even the opposite side. Yeah. And that's what the, yeah, Got exactly. It. The, Got so it. the, so the confirmation, the, the tendency towards confirmation bias is, is echo chamber and it's a pretty typical behavior. We all are drawn towards that behavior. Open-mindedness that leads to this ability to be, you know, better at uh, predictions, possibly more pleasant to have at dinner parties, is the is the search for people to help them disprove their theories, to to engage in actual dialogue and questioning around what you think you know. It, it happened on our Facebook. Like right. I've seen this this behavior from people that even the assertion that we misjudge how other people on the other side of issues think was something they were unwilling to even entertain. Right. Because that's how right or wrong sides have to be. And the core belief is that right and wrong are just facts. And and so the 
one of the really interesting things about the article to me in, in the like next step here is one of the things that they did in this in one of the studies, I'm not sure if it was the same study, they just they took um they took people who um in the Brexit vote, the run up to the Brexit vote that happened in a while ago. Um, and they took and asked them, they asked the a small sample of people uh, to interpret made up statistics about the efficacy of a rash curing skin cream. And they were able to correctly assess and interpret those statistics in terms of whether the cream was actually useful or not useful or effective and, and to, and to make good judgments around it. Yeah. But when that same group of people were given similarly false data presented as if it indicated that immigration either increased or decreased crime, hordes of Brits suddenly became enumerate and misinterpreted statistics that disagreed with their beliefs. Yeah. So they had the ability to think critically around the fake skin cream However, when given something that was more emotional, they yeah. were not able to do it. And so for me, that was a really interesting moment um, in terms of thinking about it because I, I did think – I do think that I attached the, um, the misinterpretation of data to sort of the, the person's perception. Like either you are going to be pretty good at interpreting statistics or you're not. Yeah. And this made me realize, like, oh, actually, it depends a little bit on 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 how emotional maybe or how political or and so that means that people who are really good at that might be fooled into thinking they're really good at it all the time, yeah. <laughs> when, when actually their emotions getting involved can make them quite bad at it. So this is I, I thought that was a kind of an interesting moment to to notice in the for me. And I think we've seen the proof of that in some regards. With social media, right? Because that's where, that's where even in the, the, you know, and I hate to use this term because it's been warped, but it was true prior to 2016. There was fake news. There was news sources that actually didn't even exist, but an article being thrown out to throw up some sort of numbers and half the people that read it saw it as confirmation of what they believed and the other people saw it as confirmation of their belief that it was the opposite of that. And it turned out it was all just didn't even exist. Nobody even thought critically enough to analyze that news source or, you know, why this is why the media bias chart that we, we looked at and, and the way in which, you know, it really called out some of the completely non-existent, again, I don't want to use the word fake <laughs> news sources that, that were being thrown out there to basically just rile people up. But in the end, what it showed over and over and over was that no matter what you believe, you could probably find the information and confirm it. No matter how, you know, outlandish it might be. Right. And, and uh, they did the same uh, st sort of study in America with um, Americans and gun control. As, uh, yeah. The skin cream, I'm sorry, and gun control. And had the same results that the... But, you know, regardless of political viewpoint, if y you were able to interpret the skin cream statistics that did not in any way guarantee that the gun control or gun uh, violence statistics would be equally uh, well interpreted. Yeah. And and so just to be aware of that, I think for me, that's also like reading this. I'm like, oh, OK, I really do have to remember that the the ideas that I have about certain issues are just as easily programmed into me as the ones that I see being programmed into other people. And it's my job to be vigilant and to pay attention to that, or I'm just part of the problem. Yeah. A few weeks ago, there was a poll on Fox News, and and they had to speak to the results, even though I would imagine there are people that, that weren't thrilled about this. But the poll said that 62% of Americans that they polled actually support stricter gun laws. And that's so counter to this belief. I mean, in order for that number to be true, we are dipping into um, conservatives and possible NRA members and just all sorts of people that have traditionally not been in support of that. To, to have that number actually get near the two-thirds of all Americans support stricter gun laws was huge. 
And it was a Fox News poll. I mean, you know, again, trusting the news source and whatever and the bias, but they had to basically report what they found. And that's not insignificant. Yeah. Right. And and it shows that maybe people are starting to swing away from some of those um, caricatures that we have. Right. That if you're conservative, you don't support gun control, except that, like I said, that a high enough number to swing that up to 62 percent have to actually start be being in that realm. Yeah. Well, exactly. And and so one of the things that they talk about a trait uh that they talk about in this article that the scientists who were doing this work said that um, countered what they call bias judgment. So they're calling this this um, unwillingness to even look, even be paid to look at a different view, <laughs> which leads to this statistical misinterpretation, yeah. likely. It, they're calling that bias judgment. And um, they say you can actually develop the trait to counter it, which they're calling science curiosity. And uh, so there's some, and they said that's different than science knowledge. This isn't about going to school for biology or something. Yeah. Science curious folks always choose to look at new evidence, whether it is aligned with their beliefs or not. Less science curious adults beca- become more resistant to contrary evidence and more politically polarized as they gain subject matter. Yeah. Uh, subject matter knowledge. So that's also important to realize is that the one of the things they and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but one of the things that they noted is that the more of an expert you are on a topic, the less science curious you are likely to be. Yeah, that, And more biased judgment. That's something I've heard before and seems really significant to me. Um, experts often tend to lack the ability to see anything but what they have dug into. Yeah, and they, they explain it a little bit. Uh, the first step was the, there's a 20-year study that tested the ability of experts to make accurate predictions about geopolitical events. Yeah. The results, um, sort of truncated, showed that the average expert in a given subject matter was also on average a horrific forecaster. The area of specialty, academic degrees, and even access to classified information made no difference. Some of the most narrowly specialized experts actually performed worse as they accumulated credentials. Yeah. It seemed the more vested they were in a worldview, the more easily they could always find information to fit it. Careful with this one, though, because I can think of one area where this doesn't necessarily benefit something that, you know, I am worried about and, we, and we've brought up not as much on the show, but it's obviously a politically hot button issue. The climate change science groups all tend to be very, very expert on the subject and very committed to their beliefs. And it does beg the question of being, you know, around anything. Like, even if we agree with it, you have to be critical and and have critical thought. And so what it's actually made me do like this knowledge, because I, I have heard this before, what has actually made me do is start just looking at alternate sources to confirm things. For example, fact, July was the hottest month on record on the planet in 140 years of tracking it. That is July 2019, a few months ago. Many people jumped up and said that is climate change. And I would tend to agree with it, but I'd actually like to see some of the science as to why, because there have been a lot of hypotheses that, you know, as temperatures increase, it would mean more rain. It wasn't as wet of a month. So case in point, rather than just saying, oh, climate change, it got hot, which I believe is happening. I would still like to critically think about it and become, it it made me curious to think about the ways in which I could explore what is actually happening? What are the mechanisms that are going on? Well, so I think in some ways climate change might have some built-in resilience around this in that uh, they said one subgroup of scholars did much better at predicting geopolitical events. Those who were not intellectually anchored to a narrow area of expertise. They didn't hide from contrary 
and apparently contradictory views, but rather crossed disciplines and political boundaries to seek them out. And climate change cuts across several disciplines. Yeah. And it really is an amalgamation of scientists who study the ocean, who study the atmosphere, who study, you know, the effects of different things, increases in forest fires and things like that. So it's true. I mean, you can compile the information yourself by looking at all of the source material at a micro level to determine what the macro view really looks like. I mean, my I will tell you that the thing that I've seen in the in the news and I think Chet may have mentioned it on the show, uh, but New York Times did a couple articles on climate piracy, climate migration, and um, climate capitalism, or, or not, what is it when um, people try to make money off a, and exploit a, a disaster? Climate change exploitation. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, there's some sort of like fancy word for I'm not for sure. It. Okay. Put the definition rate. in the show notes afterwards because <laughs> I know t- you'll look it up. <laughs> I will look it up. You're right. But but there's, there's people, there's like... Um, there's people who are poised to exploit climate change, um, large companies, and 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 there's a there's been actual like like I said like they really was a New York, New York Times article I'll see if I can find it for the show notes, and so to me we've got you know capitalists we've got scientists we've got um, you know journalists we've got multiple disciplinaries disciplines saying we got to pay attention politicians um, farmers and so. That's where um, that's where they're saying like the uh, the it's the expertise it's the narrow expertise that is the thing that makes you less likely to be able to pl- to predict it. The people who are even if they are an expert in one area, if they are able to um, allow themselves to participate in other areas, they're less likely to have that biased judgment, well, and they're and more, more likely to have that science curiosity. Right, and more importantly. Um, to not necessarily focus on being an expert in one specific area, but also to understand the greater ramifications of multiple areas that are interrelated. Right. And so, um, and so talking about this forecasting thing, uh, Tetlock, he was the gentleman who did that um, study. He gave the forecasters nicknames borrowed from a well-known philosophy essay, the narrow view hedgehogs who know one big thing and are terrible forecasters. And the broad-minded foxes who know many little things and make better predictions. The latter group's hunt for information was a bit like a real fox's hunt for prey. They roam freely, they listen carefully, and they consume omnivorously. And so um, what he did, and then with a, a, a collaborator, was they assembled a team of, I don't know if it's appropriate to say this, foxy volunteers. <laughs> I love scientists. They're so oddly humorous and drawn from the general public to just random people like you or me. We could fit in that and to do a forecasting tournament. And they, they're um, this group of volunteers drawn just from, I mean, they probably had some level of knowledge they wanted them to have, but what they wanted them to actually have was this Fox science curiosity thing. They trounced the intelligence analysts who had access to classified information. And he said the best forecasters, it, it's not what they think, but how they think. They argue differently. Foxes frequently use the word however in assessing ideas. Hedgehogs tend towards moreover. I don't feel like I've ever used the word moreover, but more because I think it's something to do with the 1800s. Yes. Uh, <laughs> foxes also look far beyond the bounds of the problem for clues from other similar situations. So like, you're, like I was saying, like that it's not just that there's like scientists worried about it, but there's... Um, businesses ready to exploit it like there's more than just one industry noticing it but they're responding to it in their different ways and so the they're saying the reasonable conclusion is that curiosity and a broad range range of knowledge might be a kind of superpower hedgehog experts have more than enough knowledge about the minutia of an issue in their specialty to cherry pick details to fit preconceived notions so if i if i'm an expert in um you know, at like, I don't know, soil erosion or whatever, and I don't like the idea of climate change, I might be able to cherry pick things to counter what's happening just in soil erosion. Whereas if I'm looking at the broad spectrum of things, it's just going to be impossible to ignore what's happening. Right. You won't cherry pick individual things from each discipline to create your own. That would be much harder to do. Which, you know, and again, 
it's going to sound a little judgmental, but you see the climate change deniers and they don't often have a really good argument as to why. It's just, it's not happening. No, no, it's not happening. Yeah. They, they, their arguments are based on the earth is cyclical. It's just getting warmer. It's no big deal. Yeah. They're, they're, it's, it's not what we're doing. There's, there's no science behind it. And, and they are considered experts on it because they have an opinion. But, you know, they're not even, they're not even an expert on, you know, usually, I, I would be curious to see. I bet you that usually they are some sort of an expert in one area. And they can justify their argument on it based on um, the majority of them tend to be based on archaeology. The Earth cycles; it gets warm, it gets cold. Yeah. Well, and you know, climate change had like the worst branding when it started because they called it global warming, and because that was the first uh, possible impact that was, um, I guess, predictable. And then yeah. they're like, "Oh, but maybe may actually it'll lead to freezing." And and so, and so like that, I feel like that, um, the brand issue in some ways kind of pe- people who, for whatever reason, de- were deniers just jumped on it. Right. And that's still something you'll hear. And then the other thing you'll hear is what you're saying, like the, the earth cycles, you know, we're never going to put as much pollutants into the, into the air as a volcano does. Like there's all of this kind of, and some of that is based on legitimate observations it's just just not necessarily narrow narrow observations but narrow observations exactly and that's what they're saying more skillful forecasters people who are good at this depart from a problem to consider completely unrelated events with structural commonalities so they take that outside view and it's that breadth rather than the depth of knowledge that it scaffolds their skill and it's like oh that's a really interesting point like that um Will, that willingness to look beyond what's right in front of you and, and like you said, to, to make legitimate um, observations based on a very narrow set of circumstances, it doesn't mean that what you're saying isn't accurate or true or even worth listening to. It just means that there's probably more worth including in the conversation. Yeah, it makes total sense. So I guess if there's a closing thought on this one, it would be something we highly recommend, and now backed up by a study. Be a fox. <laughs> Don't focus on single things. Look at look at the bigger picture, and fundamentally be curious. Try to understand the different aspects, the different sides, but most importantly, just try to understand what story is being told by multiple sources, instead of just saying a couple of narrow things must be true. Yeah. Well, and, and in, in line with our, our, our new slogan, be the change, <laughs> I would say if, if you, if you hear yourself in your internal dialogue or however that works for you, immediately rejecting something. Yeah. Don't be dismissive. Give yourself a chance. Like just, just, just acknowledge that there might be more. It's, it's, one of the things Even if you don't agree with it, it would really, really make a difference in the world if we could all try to understand the other side. Well, and one of the things that, and I know you've heard me say this a lot, is that in most situations, there isn't really like a right-wrong thing happening. Like climate change is way too big for one person to be right or wrong about it. And so if you can remove that instinct, instead of saying, oh, you know, this has to be wrong because I want to be right, and just say, this is one thing that's happening. I wonder how it fits in with the thing that I know and kind of try to explore where that meets. It's a, it's a very helpful way to get out of locking yourself down. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Welcome to the Bicurian Moment. So for this um, episode, we decided to do a combined one because we both kind of felt equally strong on it. And maybe it should be a show, but at this point, since it's only just kind of roaming around in the news cycle, um, we figured we were just going to talk about what's wrong with the idea of presidential decrees that state the 
FTC and FCC can censor online people. So, right. context. There was shootings. They found manifestos. They saw um, various hate groups on there pushing their hate speech. And by they, I am actually talking about the Trump uh, administration and in a knee-jerk way started talking about decrees to censor that. Right. And you you sent that to me with a, a comment about the horrifying nature of the link. And I, you know, I read through it and, and then, you know, been thinking about my sort of bicurian moment around it of on the one hand, yeah, something has to be done. And, and, and to a certain extent, the government is responsible to uh, ho- hold a line around this kind of behavior, right? They, they, there's, there's a problem. And, and holding a line about censoring or in some way shutting down and limiting access of hate speech in online areas, specifically social media, but also other places. Well, and, and just really recognizing that it does have an impact. You know, this manifesto echoed, uh, you know, popular conservative uh, talk people as well as our current president. And, and it's just not okay. And so we, we do have to do something. And let me re- reiterate, our current president <laughs> was being, um, w- was, was being reiterated in this manifesto. And so the, the government is not necessarily any more equipped to identify what is dangerous around this in this large way and to say what shouldn't, shouldn't happen because I don't really think that he would censor himself. Right. Because he hasn't. And on the surface, I can see how a lot of people would say, you know what? It's right to turn off the channels that hate speech has a method to get out. Knee jerk, feel good legislation, in this case, presidential decree, shut it down. Yeah, exactly. One problem. And this is what really is terrifying about it. If they have that power, whoever's in power, left or right, has the right to go in and argue that liberal thought is hateful. We're talking about a president who doesn't particularly, so far as the evidence suggests, like brown people, women, specifically brown women especially, um, people who aren't Christian. If they determine that any of the speech that those people are saying is, in their view, which is the key point here, hateful, they can turn it off. He well, already told people to leave the country. Right. Because they weren't American enough. Well, and and that exchange, like if you follow, if you ever choose to hurt yourself in this way and follow like some of those Twitter threads as I have done, what you'll see is when, you know, Iman uh, Omar or AOC um, says something like this uh, behavior, this r- racist language has to stop. It is inciting violence and and causing problems in our communities. Like a statement like that will will be called super hateful towards the president. Yeah. And and so the the people that follow the line of thinking that the uh, Republican conservative community currently stands for are actually right now saying that calling someone to account for their words and their behavior, acknowledging that they have an impact of their actions, is hateful. And we don't we don't want that to go away. No. And so I think part of it is we don't have a particularly effective definition of hate speech, or at least it's not willing to be acknowledged in an, in a universal enough way. Because I think that's one of the, I think that would actually be one of the more helpful things is to find something that people from multiple perspectives or the majority of people from multiple perspectives could acknowledge. Like this is a reasonable definition of of hate speech this is the kind of stuff that does have to come down right calling for violence specifically things like that i could see the ways in which they could do it and yet the reason the first amendment exists is because 
for every person who says something you don't agree with, there's probably somebody who says something you do. And giving anybody any kind of unilateral control over that is how every bad regime in history has started. Yeah, it's it's a it's absolutely a pathway to fascism. It, it is a pathway to fascism. It is state-run censorship. It leads to state-run media because eventually the only stories you'll see are the ones they approve. It's a slippery slope. And so the feel-good side of it, of telling neo-Nazis that they're shut down on their Twitter and Facebook accounts, feels good. But realistically, the FCC and the government is not able... They can't do it. They have too many dogs and too many hunts to be trusted. I think so. The good news is, I mean, hopefully, if something like this is going on, um, even by the time the show airs, um, it'll just get killed by the Supreme Court. Like it can't stand. It's against the First Amendment, and it does mean we have to tolerate and be smart about the media that we consume, and call out hate speech, and. I could even see private companies, you know, they, they, they can censor this. They, they've been proven that they can have allowances of what's allowed on their websites. And it's not necessarily censorship or First Amendment issues if it is found to be threatening or a lot of different things. The First Amendment does not allow threats and, and things like that. So I, I I hate to say it. I think we should put it in the hands of like Facebook to police it with a very strict terms of service to be there. They essentially could be treated like a private club. Yeah, I mean, I think that the what I've seen somewhat effective in different places is exactly that having a having a clear standard for the community and and then applying that standard unilaterally. Unilaterally, that's like, the key. It's only censorship if you're not doing it equally. Right. Everybody has to have the same treatment. And it's one of the things that, uh, you know, I put in that article, the three tips for better internet conversations, and I'm just going to put it in this moment as well, which is that if you see something taken down, because this is what the Trump administration is doing right now, they feel like, you know, conservatives are being unfairly attacked by these platforms. And yet the reality is that uh, my own experience, plenty of LGBT groups that were engaging in like extreme uh, language, uh, especially in the the heyday of uh, our earlier activism, were absolutely shut down, and they still are today. And and you know, so it's it's really most of these organizations really do apply it across the board. It's just that if you are not part of the LGBTQ community, you may not know that so and so's. Um, I think it was the woman who did the Bechdel test. Like one of her manifestos was taken down at one point because it was like a, a little bit angry in a way that wasn't appropriate for the platform that she was on. And, and if you agree, you might be mad about that, but it has to be unilateral. It has to be, and that's what I'm saying is that like in that moment, I'm pretty sure a bunch of like her friends were like, "Well, I don't ever do that to like you know." people who like guns and the reality is that just because you see it not happen because some people do get away with things I mean that's a thing that happens it doesn't mean it isn't applied and so that's where one of my things was like just do a quick google search on your assumptions if you think that you know conservatives are being attacked do a quick google search on who else has been removed and you'll find that people who have different politics than you were removed for their statements as well I'm not saying it's all clean and good. I'm not saying they're doing a great job. And it's very rarely, well, you know, touted towards one group the way that we like to assume when we feel, like you said, upset and we agree with them and we want them to get it out there. And Yeah. Yeah. So Again, critical thought. And just understand anything that you think is a good idea, please stop and think for a moment about the ways in which it can be used against you. So thanks for listening. If you have ideas, thoughts, feedback, Please find us on social media. We are by Curian on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I love talking to people on Twitter, so please come, come tweet with me. Or give us a call at 720-507-7309 and shoot an email, podcast at bycurian.com. And if you like what we're doing, please rate us on your listening platform of choice. Thanks, and have a good week. 